Oh, okay, folks, good morning. Um, we are recording, yes. <laughs> right. It's on. Okay, uh, so welcome again to Kabbalah Decoded. This morning we're going to talk about the concept of resistance to change. And also connect it with the events that have happened recently in France. <clears throat> I think there's an, uh, a very a very clear connection. I'll explain a little bit later on. <clears throat> Today's class is based I mean, is based on the concept of um, well, actually the first verse in this week's Torah reading, which reads like this. I'll say the Hebrew first and then translate. Vayetze Yaakov mi Be'er Vayelech Harana. Jacob left Be'er Sheva, the town in Israel. Uh, near the southern border of Israel, Vayel Haran, and he went to Haran. Now, the background to the story is as follows. Jacob had taken the blessings that uh, Isaac wanted to give um, to Esav. Esav, his older brother, they were actually twins, but Esav was born first. Uh, <coughs> and um, Rebecca, Rivka, <coughs> had uh, instructed Jacob to go in disguise um, into Isaac, who was blind at the time, who was blind at this time, and receive the blessings instead. Why? Because she was afraid that the blessings, which were intended for the Bechor, the Bechor meaning the firstborn, the, intent, the blessings which were intended for the firstborn, would give um, Esau, Esau, <coughs> powers that he would misuse. He was not ready for prime time. He wasn't ready to be the, uh, to be the Bechor, to be the firstborn. Traditionally, the firstborn child was always the one who took upon himself, uh, had the obligations of family worship. He was the leader of family worship. Esau was not that kind of person. He was not interested at all in that. Uh, he was interested in having a good time. And Rivka, Rebecca knew that if he were to get the blessings, things would not be good. In any event, after he gets the blessings, uh, Esau is a little bit uh, peeved, he might uh, say. <laughs> and he wants to kill him. <clears throat> so Rebecca, Rivka tells her son, Jacob, uh, Yaakov, go to leave leave the area until he's calmed down a bit. Um, Yitzhak, his father, tells him to go to Haran <coughs> to attempt to find a wife, to get married and to settle down. Um, so there's really two instructions that he has. One is from his mother to leave Beersheba. The others from his father to go to Haran. Now, um, <clears throat> Haran was where um, where his mother was from originally, and uh, where her brother was living, and he should seek a wife amongst her brother's kin. <clears throat> That's what he was told to do. Now, basically, the idea is. The verse says, leave Beersheba and go to Haran. So the, um, <clears throat> the commentators, some of the commentators uh, ask the question, generally the Torah is very, very um, stingy with words. In other words, it only uses absolutely necessary words only when it's absolutely necessary and will not use extraneous expressions. So we have to ask ourselves, why is it that the Torah says, leave Beersheba and go to Haran? If you're leaving Beersheba already, you're going somewhere else, that's obvious. And if you're going to Haran, you're leaving Beersheba. Why the double language? <clears throat> why the double expression? So the explanation, or one of the explanations that's given is, there are really two things. When a person wants to change his situation, when he wants to go to a new place, he has to make sure that he's completely left the old place. 
if he's going to Haran, he has to have left Be'er Sheva completely. <clears throat> you can't have a one foot in the previous, um, your previous situation and one foot in the new situation and expect to thrive in your new situation. <clears throat> one has to completely leave the previous situation. <coughs> Excuse me. So, basically the idea therefore is, <clears throat> his mother and father are telling him together that there is a way to approach a new stage in life. Although generally we rely on our past histories and we take them with us, sometimes this doesn't work. Sometimes the past history that we have is a hindrance to a new level of um, to a new level of service, to a new level of interpretation, to a new level of consciousness, to a new level of, uh, of, of understanding, of enlightenment. Sometimes it helps and sometimes it doesn't. <clears throat> the classic example that's given uh, of this is the sage, um, Rabbi Zera. Rabbi Zaire actually went in the opposite direction. He left Babylon. He was brought up and born and brought up in Babylon, Babylonia. And he left to go to live in Israel. <clears throat> now, there were two um, types of, there were, there were two versions of the Talmud. There's what's called the Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, and the Talmud Yerushalmi in the Jerusalem Talmud. The Jerusalem Talmud is basically a straightforward explication of the various laws that are found in the Mishnah. The Mishnah is the um, rabbinic teachings that derive from the verses in the Torah, giving us the practical lessons in what we have to do in order to keep the commandments properly. So, the six orders of the Mishnah, and... Um, these are subdivided into what are called Masechtas. A Masechta is a tractate, and the various tractates, uh, 70 tractates altogether um, in, in the Mishnah. And um, these are then expounded upon in the Talmud Yerushalmi, but in a very uh, straightforward way, without any sort of philosophical, with very with minimal philosophical argument. Whereas in the Babylonian Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud is full of argument and discussion backwards and forwards <coughs> until a conclusion is reached, and sometimes no conclusion is reached, often enough. So the difference between the Talmud Yerushalmi and the Talmud Bavli is the Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, is based on, essentially based on uh, logical inquiry, Whereas the Jerusalem Talmud is just basically the statement of the law as it is in as it is concluded. So it represents two very different approaches to things. So when Rabbi Zaira traveled from Babylon, where he'd learned only the Babylonian Talmud to the land of Israel, it says that he fasted at least for 40 days according to one version, according to a different version, he fasted for a hundred days. Um, in order to forget the Babylonian Talmud, so that he could acquire, he could learn the Jerusalem Talmud with a clean slate, so to speak. Now, you can ask yourself the question, you know, logically, intellectually, we all know, uh, most of us have been to, uh, many of us have been to university, <clears throat> You know that the, the, the basis that you learn in the first year is the foundation for what you learn in the second year. And what you learn in the second year is generally a basis and a foundation for what you learn in the third year. In other words, you build, knowledge builds. Now, that's absolutely true, except when the knowledge is a quant, the second type of knowledge is a quantum leap from the first. And that's really what the, the Jerusalem Talmud represents, a quantum leap away, a quantum leap higher than the Babylonian Talmud. And that's why Rabbi Zaira spent 40 days or 100 days fasting in order to, um, um, 
in order to forget the Babylonian Talmud that he could now acquire a completely new, a quantum leap higher form of understanding. Now, you could ask the question, um, you know, how could a person survive for 40 days and almost most up to 100 days without food and water, etc. It's not understood from this that he fasted, um, that, he, that, he, that he took water, that he took water um, or ate at night. It seems, from what we understand, that he fasted for 40 days or 400 days. Now, Moses also did that when he was on Mount Sinai. So it's not unprecedented, but this man wasn't Moses. Rabbi Isaiah was a very curious and interesting character, and apparently he had trained himself to have completely uh, mastered his physical body, to the extent that the sages tell us that uh, he had a nickname, and his nickname was um, translated, loosely translated, would be called charred legs or black legs. And the story is told that Rabbi Zaira, in order to train himself <clears throat> to have complete mastery over his physical body, he would actually he train himself to be able to sit in a fire and not get burned. Now, you've heard of people like uh, walking on burning coals and so on and so forth, but that's for a few minutes, a few seconds that they walk on the coals and they aren't, uh, they aren't burnt. He would actually sit for an hour or two in this fire and would not get burned. Now, why he did it is another question altogether, but um, um, the sages say that, why was he called black leg or charred legs? Because one day his attention was distracted, his focus, he was distracted by a noise, something happened, he was distracted, and he took his concentration off what he was concentrating on that allowed him not to be burned by the fire and uh, that's how he got burned. His legs got burned. They got charred. <clears throat> so that's why they called him when they gave him that nickname. So he was a pretty amazing um, uh, person. Now, I don't suggest anyone tries this for themselves at home. <laughs> this is um, only for someone who has absorbed the Torah, which is called fire, is he immune to fire. That's basically how they explain it. Okay, so, to get back to what we were talking about. <clears throat> In order for Jacob to go to Be'er Sheva, to go to Haran, he had to leave Be'er Sheva. But because there was a quantum leap between one place and the other, he had to leave one before he could actually get to the other. Now, you might ask, and it's a valid question, it would seem that Haran, being an unholy place, the word Haran actually means, translated, it means like the anger of God, Haran Af Shalmakom, the burning anger of God. It's a place where godliness is not evident at all. And therefore, um, you would expect that if he's going a quantum leap, it will be a quantum leap higher, and therefore, um, that's why he would have to leave the previous place, whereas if he was going from a holy place to an unholy place, he would want to take the holiness of the previous place with him. Now, that is true to a very large extent, but when one is approached, one is faced with a situation which is so different from anything that anybody has ever, that, that, that the person has ever known before, so it doesn't help to use your previous tactics, your previous strategies, your previous approaches in order to deal with a completely new situation. This is the message that, that uh, Jacob was giving us. He had to leave Be'er Sheva. In other words, he had to leave behind his approach to godliness that he'd had in the land of Israel, that he'd been taught and he'd uh, absorbed in the home of Isaac, Isaac, and Rivka, Rebekah. And he had to fashion a completely new approach to dealing with the extremely wily and crooked Lavan, his uncle, Laban, 
who he was going to uh, be spending some time with. And we see that he, indeed he did manage to master the psychology of Lavan, of Laban. Now, the idea here is that at times we faced issues which are not just an incremental, where an incremental change is needed, but where a fundamental change is needed. In order to be able to come to this fundamental change, this fundamental change of heart, change of perspective, change of vision, change of understanding, in order to be able to do that, sometimes we have to take our foot out of the previous world in order to enter into the new one. We can't straddle both worlds at the same time because then we're not in the first one and we're not in the second one. That's why a lot of the time people are so resistant to change. The resistance to change is because of, for, for really for the, for, for the following reasons. A, they don't know where they're going to. A person doesn't know where they're going to. And if you don't know where you're going to, as uh, Yogi Berra famously said, if you don't know where you're going to, you may never get there. <clears throat> Again, if you don't know where you're going to, you may never get there. But also, a person has to know where he is going from. It's not just good enough to leave the place where you were previously. You have to know where you're going to. You have to have a fairly clear, defined, uh, clearly defined goal or target that you're trying to reach. I'll just expand on that for a minute. I think I've told the story here probably multiple, time, multiple times already. It's an analogy um, where a general <coughs> who was going to the war front was passing through a little village and he had his uh, soldiers with him. And uh, he saw on the side of a barn, he saw arrows in the middle of a target. Uh, there were many, many targets drawn on the side of a barn. And each one had an arrow in the very bullseye of the target. So he was pretty amazed. General's always looking for good marksmen. And he wondered who the archer was. And he tried to make many inquiries. And, uh, and initially, no one knew who it was until eventually they found out. He found out it was a young boy, a 10-year-old boy, who was the expert marksman. And he wanted this boy to join, his, uh, to join his army. He could make use of his talents. So he says to the boy, are these, are these are your targets? Yes. Show me how you do it. And he gave the boy a bunch of arrows and a bow. The boy takes the arrow and he shoots, and he fits into the bow, and he shoots into the side of the barn. And then he takes out a piece of chalk and he draws a target around the arrow. <clears throat> End of analogy. Now, what, what, what are we supposed to learn from this analogy? Well, if a person shoots his arrows and wherever they land, he then builds his justification around that and he builds his philosophy around where, wherever it is that the arrow lands. So he hasn't really achieved very much. Whereas if you have a target and you shoot your arrow, even if you don't hit the target, at least you know what you have to do to rectify the situation. I have to aim a little bit higher, I have to aim a little bit more to the right, or whatever it may happen to be. I have to use a little more strength, pull, it, pull the uh, string of the bow back further, you know, or that'll get to its target, and so on and so forth. And even if one misses the target several times, at least you know what your goal is. Very, very important, the importance of setting goals. So if you don't know where it is that you're going to when you're leaving the previous thing, again, you probably won't get there. You'll just build a justification around wherever it is that you happen to land. There has to be a purpose. There has to be a goal. There has to be uh, a target in mind. But that's also not always good enough to simply know where it is that you're going. You have to know where it is that you left from as well. Why is it important to know where it is that you left from? Because you have to take your foot out of the previous existence in order to go to the, to the next one. You can't be solidly in the new place if you're still reminiscing, 
and hankering after the old place. Let's say very often it happens with people who are uh, alcoholics and are trying to reform themselves. And they're trying to uh, get out of the alcoholic uh, disease, essentially. Some people find it very, very, very difficult because they sort of reminisce about the times that they were the previous times. They haven't let it go yet. In order to get to the new place, you have to let go. You have to let go of the rope. Another analogy, when a person is parachuting, um, as you, uh, you may have seen, there's different ways in which they do it, but sometimes it's, there was a hook, uh, sort of, and, and, and uh, a hook in the person's, it's got a sort of a brace on, and there's a hook at the back, and then as he jumps out of the plane, the hook releases, and uh, that's how he gets out. Some, in some cases, it used to be they would actually hold on to a rope. So if you're holding on to the rope from previously, if you don't let the rope go, you're never going to actually get out of the plane. You're still there. So hanging on to the past, hanging on to the previous um, situation doesn't allow us very often to move to the new one. Now, um, it can also happen of course, that when one lets go of the previous situation, it can be a pretty nerve-wracking situation because uh, suddenly you're in limbo. You haven't arrived at the new place yet, but you have left the old place, and now you're sort of in limbo. You're in between. You're, you're, you're nowhere. You're in no man's land. The answer is that as long as you know where you're going to, you'll be okay. There's a famous paradox called Zeno's Paradox. You've probably heard of it. Um, it's in philosophy and logic. <clears throat> Zeno's Paradox. A person shoots an arrow from point A to point B. But how will the arrow ever get there? Because there's an infinite amount of uh, space between uh, point A and point B. If you say, think of it like this, divide um, the space between point A and point B, right? And then, uh, so then you get in the middle somewhere, you get, let's say, point C. And then from A to C, there's also, it's possible to subdivide again between A and C. And then subdivide again and subdivide again and subdivide again. There's, there's, there's an infinite number of subdivisions that one can make just between A and C. Never mind between A and B. An infinite number of subdivisions. So how does the arrow actually ever get past that infinite number of subdivisions? Because the arrow knows only one thing. It's going towards the target. It's not interested in the philosophy behind it and in, in, in how you transverse. It's got its eyes on the goal, and then it will be able to um, move forward. There was a very... Um, a very interesting and actually quite famous person who I met and I spent a significant amount of time with. His name was, uh, he passed away uh, a few years ago. <clears throat> His name was Rabbi Mendel Futefas. Very interesting person. Very, uh, as a tremendously courageous uh, person who basically fought against the communist government. How did he fight against the communist government? Not with weapons and things like that, but um, he tried to uh, ship his fellow human beings that had been persecuted by the uh, communist government at that time, uh, particularly his Jewish compatriots. Um, he tried to ship them out of, um, out of Russia one way or another. So what he would do, he was actually he would actually hijack trains. He would hijack the train and then drive the train to um, over the border and then bring it back <laughs> and wait for the next one. Um, he was quite a he was quite a character. Um, in any event, um, this uh, Rabbi Futafas was eventually caught and he was imprisoned. Uh, he was sent to Siberia. And was there for a significant period of time, like 18 years. 
So um, in uh, in Siberia, he he made the decision that since he could not learn Torah where he was, except from what he could learn from memory, so he was going to try and learn from every incident, every event that took place. He was going to try and learn some kind of moral lesson, either a moral lesson or a lesson in life or a lesson in uh, in in uh, in understanding. But he would try and multiple times throughout the day, any event that happened, anything that happened, he would try and understand in a larger context. Let's put it that way. So one of the incidents that uh, that occurred then, actually, was um, a person was put into the prison who was a tightrope walker. And this tightrope walker um, was actually, a, he was a famous type of tightrope walker, but he was anti he was anti the communist government, and so he was also imprisoned with the rest of the political prisoners. Uh, so Rabbi Mendel started to talk to this um, this man because he wanted to find out, like, uh, you know, what, what can I learn from someone who walks a tightrope? And this is the lesson that the man told him. He said to him, it's not difficult to walk across a tightrope, But you have to focus. You can't focus on where you are now. You have to focus on where you're going to. You have to focus on the end. You have to focus on your end goal. So if you're going from point A to point B, you have to focus on point B. You cannot focus on where you are now on the journey. Focus on the end point, not on the middle or where you are right now. But the biggest danger, he said, is when a tightrope walker turns around. Apparently it was traditional, I don't know if it's done today, but it was always traditional that uh, you walk one way, then you walk back the other way again. And he said, that's when the danger happens. That's when the greatest danger is. Because for a moment, as you're turning around, you lose sight of your goal. And if you lose sight of your goal and you don't have it in mind, that's when you could lose your balance and fall. So, Rabbi Mendel um, took this, uh, this, this idea to heart very much. And he was always very conscious of where it was that he was going to, what his goal had to be. Once he'd achieved that goal, he said that that was now, what he understood was that was now the danger point. Once you achieve your goal, if you don't immediately turn around and focus on another goal, then um, you're in danger of falling. In other words, a person always has to progress. You can't rest on your, your laurels. You can't just stay where you are and turn around and sort of enjoy the view or enjoy where it is that you're now. You have to immediately focus on the next thing. Now, people are resistant to change, as I said before, for two reasons. One, they don't always want to leave the previous situation that they were in. They might be afraid to leave. They don't know what they're going towards. So it's very important, therefore, to clarify what it is that we're going towards. Now, you may not have been there before. That is true. However, in your imagination, this is where uh, using the mind comes in. One can, you know, you close your eyes and you can imagine where it is that we're going, that, uh, that, that you're going to. What will the situation be like when such and such an issue is taken care of? Using the imagination to build up as clear of a picture as possible what the future will be like when the issues that I'm facing in my present situation are resolved. What will it look like? How will I feel? Who will I be with? Who will I not be with? Um, and so on and so forth. And build up as composite and as clear a picture as possible of what that future will be in order to guide oneself towards that. Now, interestingly enough, in, uh, in, in modern, modern day psychology, they suggest that a person should do this for a, an extended period of, uh, period of time Minimum of four days, 
minimum of four days to spend on imagining day after day without a break in between, imagining what this goal will be. The more one does it, the clearer it comes into focus, the more uh, and, and the easier it'll be to reach that to reach that goal, to reach that focus. And um, that I would like to suggest is the way that we resist change. Focus on the future when the things that we are trying to change from will now be resolved and it w we will be in the new situation already. Step one. Step two, we now have to leave the previous situation and get to the new one. Now, to get from point A to point B, there are steps in between. What's the one step that I'm going to take that'll get me away from where I am now? It doesn't have to get me yet to the goal yet. I, that's, that's the tightrope that I have to walk. The other end is some distance away. I'm going to keep my focus on that, but the first step that I have to take is away from where I am. What's going to make things a little bit different right here and now, today, in this moment, that I'll know that I've left, even if I haven't left completely yet, but at least I got one foot out of the door. I'm going to take the other foot out of the door soon as well, one step at a time. There's one step, then there's another step, and there's another step until eventually we get beyond the halfway point, then there's no looking back. I'm not going away from anymore. I'm now going towards only. That's what has to be done. Now, are, are there any questions so far? Just type in the chat if you have any questions, and um, okay, doesn't look like there are any questions, so uh, we'll continue. The events uh, that took place just recently, um, I think it's important to talk about them, and. Although um, I'm sure that there's a tremendous amount that could be said uh, about the situation, I think that one thing we have to realize. Okay, Wendy, I'll talk about that in a minute, okay? Um, I think there's one thing that we have to realize. In order to be able to deal with evil, we have to be able to define it. We have to know where it is that we're going from. We have to know what the departure point is. And we also have to know what the arrival point is. We have to know what it looks like not to have this type of evil in the world. But unless one can define it and define it clearly, you're just basically shooting arrows in the dark and hoping that they land somewhere and then maybe justifying them afterwards. There has to be a clear goal, and there has to be a clear understanding of where it is that we're leaving in order to get to the goal. Unfortunately, I think in the current situation, the world is in a little bit of a, um, let's call it in a fog, without realizing what's going on. I think the president of France uh, suddenly came to this realization yesterday, on Friday night, their time, uh, whatever, or yesterday, when he said this is a de declaration of war. I think he's a little bit late realizing that the declaration of war happened a long time ago already, from the other side. And um, it's very important for us in our own private lives, in our own personal lives, to know that there is good and there is evil. And to be able to deal with evil, one has to take very concrete steps and know where it is that you're going. Unfortunately, in the Western society, I think to a very large extent, we've lost touch with what's good, what's right. 
these days in the academies in particular, in uh, academies of higher learning, everything's relative. Oh, this is good because it's good for you, but it may not be good for someone living in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, or it may not be good for someone living in the central Amazon or whatever. In other words, there's no definition of good anymore in Western society. It's, everything is relative. It's become sort of um, um, anthropological definitions. You say it's good, but he says it's bad, and so on and so forth. Therefore, we've lost, we've lost connection to what's right and what's wrong. It's not right and wrong anymore. It's only opinions. Oh, that's your opinion. But there is an objective right and wrong. And we have to know that there's an objective right and wrong. And without having that objective right and wrong in mind, even though we want to leave the previous situation, the situation of danger and death and destruction and, 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 and wanton murder, we're never going to be able to go anywhere unless we know where it is that we're going. You can't just want to step out of the darkness. You have to know where the light is. And I think this is, a, this is a problem that we all face, and I think we should all think about it. Uh, one of the people here asked, um, can I speak a little bit more about visualize, visualization as opposed to our will as opposed to God's will? Visualization doesn't necessarily have to do with the will. In fact, um, technically speaking, in Kabbalistic terminology, it really has to do with um, chokhmah, with uh, wisdom rather than will. But be that as it may, that's not the important thing. Um, the concept of visual visualization is as follows. When a person is faced with a problem, <clears throat> there are many different ways of dealing with it. One way of dealing with it is to focus on the problem. How are we going to solve the problem? What caused the problem? Where is it coming from? What are the dimensions? When does it happen? When does it not happen? And so on and so forth. And all. we focus always on the problem. Now, there's an old expression in Kabbalah, in, in, in Jewish philosophy as well, you can't drive out darkness with a stick. You can't solve a problem by delineating the problem uh, you can't solve a problem only by delineating the problem. Yes, you have to delineate the problem. You have to know what the problem is. But it doesn't help just to, uh, to, to, to attempt to reduce the issue of the problem. What we must do is visualize what, it will, what life will be like, what things will be like when that problem doesn't exist anymore. So let's just say, for example, let, 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 me, let me give a simple example. Let's say a person has a lot of anxiety about something. Whatever the cause is, it uh, doesn't really matter for this little exercise. Yes, it may, may, may be important to find, find out the causes of the anxiety, what's, uh, what exactly is. But very often when we go into the cause of anxiety, if, you, you know, if a person goes to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, he's going to try and take you back into your childhood or some event that happened that you've forgotten about, it's in your unconscious. And who knows if that psychiatrist is going to plant false ideas in your subconscious or in your unconscious or whatever. It's not going to really work. To We do know that in certain situations, yes, we feel a certain sense of anxiety and perhaps even bordering on panic when certain um, uh, events occur within those situations. And then it goes away and it lessens and so on and so forth. So the first thing a person would do is, let's say, suffering from anxiety. Now, I'm not saying stop going to, uh, you know, if a person goes to a psychologist, psychiatrist, or takes medication, whatever. I'm not saying necessarily to, to just stop at cold turkey. But um, the suggestion is, instead of focusing on the problem and what caused it and when it happens and who's responsible for it, etc., let's try and focus on when and on, on a time when the problem will be resolved. In other words, on a time when I won't feel anxious anymore. Let me visualize what I will, what, what, what the situation will be when, I'm, when I've lost this anxiety. I'm not feeling anxious anymore. How will I feel when my anxiety is no longer provoked, when I've mastered the anxiety to the extent that I don't have panic attacks anymore, for example? Right? I'm not saying me. I'm just saying a person should be saying to himself that I thank God I don't have these things. But... Um, 
But um, so what will it look like when the person is not having a panic attack? Has it ever happened before in the past when you've managed to overcome such a situation and how did you do that? In other words, what are the steps that I took? What small actions that I do then that help me overcome that anxiety? Now, it could be that, for example, prayer might help. It could be it's a certain mindset that will help. It could be it's talking it out to other pe- with other people that will help. Or with a psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever. Mental health professional. A coach. Life coach. <clears throat> but visualizing the future, in other words, visualizing when the thing doesn't happen, start to notice what's different when this doesn't happen? What's different in my life? What's different in my feelings? What's different about the people around me? What's different about who's around me? What's different about what I'm doing in that future that I'm imagining when this doesn't happen? What's different about my thinking process? What's different about my emotional process? The stronger one tries to imagine that, the more clear the vision becomes, and you try and involve, in fact, all of your senses in it, particularly the, uh, the sense of action. Again, I mentioned before that in Kabbalah, you don't only have the five senses that we're familiar with, uh, hearing, uh, smelling, seeing, etc. But there's the... One, one of the chushim, one of the, one, one of the uh, senses, according to Kabbalah, the 12 senses, one of the senses is the sense of action. What am I going to be doing? What am I doing at that time? What am I doing? How am I feeling? What am I sensing with all of my senses? What can I see? What can I hear? What can I taste? What can I smell? Now, it could be that, uh, you know, you're not going to smell anything different or, or taste anything different, obviously. It's not, it's not always going to, you know, be, but the fuller one can make that picture, the more one can involve the senses and the more one can involve one's powers of action, well, again, what Kabbalah calls the sense of action, the more real that future becomes. So that visualization is extremely powerful in pulling us towards a different reality. So, uh, I hope that helps. When Annie asks, uh, Annie asks, when you talk about evil, how does that fit in with there is none other than him? That's a very good question, Annie. And uh, I, I would say that the answer is, uh, I'll, I'll tell the answer by a little uh, story. It was a story, about, uh, the story about someone who was named the Kotzka Rebbe, the Rebbe of Kotzk. He was a Hasidic leader and a very, um, very, very sharp individual, sharp in the sense that uh, he was very, very bright. But he was also, um, had very sharp responses to things. He wasn't a gentle, uh, wasn't a gentle type at all. He would sometimes, you know, his words could be very cutting. And I didn't use cutting words in order to hurt people, but in order to make them realize the truth very clearly. He was a person that was always focused on the truth. So he once went into his, uh, what's called his Beit Medrash, his house of study. Uh, and there were many of his followers, his disciples were sitting there and they were, they were studying or praying. And he banged on the desk and he said, okay, everybody, where is God? Hello? <laughs> What do you mean, Rabbi? You always taught us God's everywhere. So he says, yes, correct. Except where you don't let him in. Except where you don't let him in. So, when we talk about evil, we're talking about people who don't let God in. They are talking, you know, these, these, these crazy jihadists are doing this, so to speak, for the sake of God. I mean, what kind of God would want carnage like, uh, like, like happened in Paris, like happened in uh, 9-11? I, what... This, this, is, this is not godliness. This is exactly the opposite. God is life. In Islamic culture and philosophy, um, 
to a very large extent, the life of this world, the way they see it, the way they understand it, is falseness, and only life, supernal life, life on a higher plane of existence, is, is life. Now, Judaism surely doesn't see it like that. We want to make for God a dwelling place in the lower world, so we want to improve the physical world. Of course, godliness is more evident in the higher worlds, but that's why we were put here, to make this world into a more holy world. It's a whole different headspace, a whole different uh, way of looking at things. In any event, um, the when we talk about evil, evil is where you don't let God in. He's there anyway, but he's not there for you. And unfortunately, we see a lot of that in our world today. Um, I just saw a headline the other day, before this whole event, there was... Um, um, there was a headline, something like um, kicking God out of the campus or something, uh, kicking God out of academia, because all of a sudden you know, there's this tremendous push against um, religious people in institutions of higher learning. In any event, yes, yeah, so the, you know, the, the academy is the kind of place where they don't let God in. Um, at least some people don't. In any event, okay, any other questions?